Hi, thanks for having me. No problem. Um, so to get this ball rolling, um, what kind of inspired you and led you into the physiotherapy uh, field? Uh, well, what started all off was uh, I grew up playing sports. I was super active and uh, when I was young, had a few knee issues kind of thing going through and uh, my parents actually sent me to physio and I ended up uh, working with this physio who won. She helped me get back uh, to my sports. So at the time I was playing volleyball uh, and running a lot and uh, helped me get back to my sports. But uh, on top of it is I was super inspired by like her approach, how she kind of explained things to me and her passion that she brought to it. Um, so I was about 14, 15, uh, 15 at the time. And then I actually ended up volunteering with her for a couple years and uh, yeah, quite a few years later, now I'm a physio. So kept that's, rolling with it. That's great. What was that like volunteering at such an early age in such a kind of a hands-on, but also cerebral uh, landscape? Uh, honestly, I was super shy when I was young, so uh, it actually pushed me out of my comfort zone. So I had to interact a lot with uh, patients who are coming in and everything like that, because I'm not just going to come in and clean up the room or do things like that and ignore them. Um, but I also got to learn a lot about various injuries, various sports, and it was really nice to kind of interact with people who are super passionate about uh, what they wanted to get back to and kind of their various sports or activities. So it was really fun to kind of vibe with people in that sense. That's great. And now you were just talking there about a little bit about your, your journey here. So you've come right across the country, um, Halifax to Port Alberni. How, how did that transpire? Uh, well, my parents are military, so I've moved around a fair bit. Uh, I mainly grew up in Ontario, so that's where I was kind of born and raised for the most part. Um, but I started uh, after graduating, I did an a undergrad degree in physical and health education. Uh, and then I went to work as an exercise physiologist for the military for a few years. And I started in Ontario and was super fortunate enough to land a job in Comox, BC. So moved across the country and uh, kept rolling with things here. Eventually transferred into working in some cardiac rehab uh, for the regional district up in Campbell River area. And then continued on to do my master's. And now I'm in Port Alberni, Euclid, Tofino area, working as a physio. So not a bad area to, no, to be in. No, definitely a slice of paradise. <laughs> yeah, it's great. I mean, there's, we could go down so many rabbit holes being in Tofino, being with the armed forces. Um, um, let's kind of park them items uh, for now and let's t kind of delve into hopefully what people want to talk about on this webinar and um, things like injury prevention and work con uh, workout content. So in these challenging times over the last month or so, um, let's talk about injury prevention. Why should we, we be bothered about injury prevention at home? What are the dangers? Uh, so I'm going to actually share my screen with you here. Going Perfect. Yep. So you guys can see what's going on. Yeah. All right. Everybody can see it. Okay. Yep. Perfect. Perfect. All right. Uh, so um, coming through to chat a little bit about kind of some of the dangers that pose of kind of uh, injury prevention and whatnot is oftentimes there's a big aspect of things and it is we do a little bit too much too soon. Uh, we change our routine a little bit too quickly. Um, and then there's a few other factors that can kind of contribute into injuries, uh, such as inadequate rest, sleep, um, increased stress levels, depression, and poor nutrition. So there's lots of different factors that can come into play. Um, but the biggest portion of danger is a lot of the times happens to be uh, a little bit of overtraining, burnout, and eventually leading into some injuries. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, so why is that kind of worthwhile discussing as we go through it? Um, the big thing that I like to kind of go through is like get a little bit of an idea as to uh, what uh, the injuries are that we kind of are presented with. So oftentimes uh, a big portion of it is we do too much too soon. So we have too much load, too much speed, too much mileage, or there's an acute change in what we're doing. So we change our terrain, uh, we change our mechanics a little bit too quickly. And Right now in a time where we're not necessarily training in our 
comfort zone in our natural environment, whether it's uh, on the field, in the gym, in the pool, wherever it may be. Uh, so there's a lot of changes that can occur and that can kind of put us at a little bit more at risk of some injuries. Uh, other factors that can contribute into this um, is decreased amounts of rest, decreased sleep patterns, depression, stress, anxiety, and uh, also poor nutrition. So what we have here, uh, you can see a little bit of this continuum, and I like to explain this to people so you have a good idea as to kind of uh, how injuries happen and you know a good way of kind of understanding the mechanics behind it. So you see here we have this lovely green line and it's the minimum load that you need to create adaptation. So if you wanna get stronger, faster, uh, jump higher, whatever it is, you need to train above that level. Now below that level is our rest area. So if we always stay in that zone, no changes occur kind of thing like that. So we just plateau, no changes happen. But this little red line here is our max adaptation. So kind of what our body is capable of putting up with. And if we push beyond our threshold um, by doing a little bit too much too soon, increase stress, whatever it may be, uh, that can lead to pain and ultimately injuries. So the goal is, is we want to find a way to train within this zone here. So our, uh, you know, minimum between our minimum and maximum zone and find ways to kind of push that ceiling so that our 100% our max adaptation uh, tends to improve. Great, awesome graphic. How do we how do we create a baseline for ourselves? And then how do we uh, create benchmarks? So uh, a great way to create a bit of a baseline for yourself, one is um, through your coaches, through your trainers through everything like that is having a good foundation. So you whatever sport you take part in is you want a good cardiovascular foundation, you want a good strength foundation, you just have your general base coming through with it. Um, and that can come through natural training, through the programs that they provide you in preseason, off season, everything like that. Um, and ways that you can provide benchmarks for yourself is throughout your training or throughout your season is to have points in times where you actually check in. So check in to see what your speed is, check in to see what your jump uh, height is, check in to see what your maximal strength is. And this can definitely vary depending on the sport you partake in and also your trainers that uh, lead you throughout the day. Yeah. Yeah. And this day and age, it's, it's the best time to be your own uh, management. You know, I, I'm sure you agree. I mean, the, the apps that are out there, um, everybody, everybody's got a phone or a device as well that they can time themselves on. So it's a great time to kind of manage that and, and create your own data. Would you agree? Oh, for sure. Uh, I firmly believe whether I have a patient coming in uh, to see me or if I'm working out myself in the gym and everything like that is I actually keep a log of things. So I, I'm a pen and paper type of person. I actually log it in a little journal. I like that, but there are numerous amounts of apps. You can take videos to look at your technique. Um, that's a great way to be able to share things uh, nowadays when you can't actually meet with uh, coaches and everything like that. Um, but there's numerous options to actually be able to see where you've started and see where you're going. Great. And going back to, uh, you know, too much too early, you must hear a lot of that right now, anecdotally, oh, you know, I've got, I've, I've, um, you know, I've got pain, I've got aches. Um, how do you know whether, whether you just should be training through that um, to reach them kind of thresholds or how do you not scale it back? Uh, so one thing I try to kind of encourage the people is if you're getting pain and it's acute, so it's a new type of pain, um, that's often a point in time of a little bit of a signal to the body telling you, you know what, maybe this is a moment where I need to scale it back. And it, that doesn't mean stop altogether, uh, but that definitely means taking a look at your programming, taking a look at what you're doing and trying to evaluate what is the kind of factor that's pushing me over the edge and causing this pain. However, if it's kind of a chronic injury, so it's been something that's been around for uh, a couple months at this point in time, and it's just something that you've been dealing with, um, that's a point in time where you can actually start to play around with it a little bit more. And you could push into a little bit more pain, um, but it's as long as you're making sure that you're uh, modifying things and you're making sure that you understand why the pain is there 
and the reasons why you're pushing through. So you're not pushing through just to do it. You're pushing through to make sure that that tissue, whatever the area that is injured is getting stronger. Right. And how much preparation is involved in this training at home? Do you feel, um, is, you know, is stretching still important or, or dynamic movements to prep still important? Uh, so prior to doing any kind of physical activity, um, an easy way to do some bit of injury prevention, injury management aspect of things is a solid warm up. So it's taking a good 10 to 20 minutes prior to whatever activity um, you're going to be doing, especially if it's more high intensity activities, um, is doing a gradual warm up. So heating up the body, getting yourself ready for that activity. But then also pairing it off with some specific drills and specific warm-ups um, to prepare you for whatever um, type of training you will be doing. Uh, the nice part of it is you can also think of a warm-up isn't only just warming up for the activity. It's also an opportunity to work on your mobility um, and work on some drills that are specific to your training that's ultimately going to only improve your level of play. So I guess the warm-ups don't have to be boring. Oh, no, of course not. Of course not. I, I don't think any training should be boring. boring. You got to find a level of kind of joy and like enjoyment as to what you're doing. Yeah, I agree. Because uh, I bet you that's one thing that's gone out the window with a lot of people, warm-ups, because there's no, there's no coach there. There's no uh, physio telling them what to do. So again, they can, uh, they can manage this on their own, right? Oh yeah, for sure. And you, you can just think back on if you're, if you're not too sure if you don't have a set warm up in place based off of the programming that your coach or your trainer has given you, you can think back on what do I do before I go into competition kind of thing. I gradually ease myself up into it. What are some good drills that, you know what, this is the point in time where like, I can actually focus a little bit more on these things. I need to focus a little bit more on my footwork, on my lateral movements, whatever it may be. And that's kind of a nice way to um, incorporate it into your warm up. So you start slow, build it up, add some more explosiveness to it, and get ready for your workout. And now going into recovery, I guess recovery, that's something that should be very uh, normal for people at home. Would you, would, you, would you say? I mean, you know, in their own environment, um, having access to, uh, nutrition um, do you think that's something that should be uh, that should be taken care of straight away oh definitely so uh, a big portion of kind of your training isn't just the kind of physical work that you put in you also need to consider what you're putting into your body how what your state of mind is what your mindset is going through things um, and uh, how much rest you're getting between your workouts how much rest you're getting at night um, all of these factors do play on how well you perform, but also how well you kind of put, uh, how much effort you end up putting into your workouts as well. Right. I see. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, so, um, sorry, were you going to say something? Oh, I was just going to say, and it's a bit of a tough time right now because like mm -hmm. we, everybody's at home and everything like that. And now your, your gym, your home, your place, you sleep, eat, everything has kind of been compacted into one location. So it makes it a little bit difficult to kind of keep that motivation and rest levels sometimes might be a little bit higher because it's difficult to kind of differentiate between home is usually where you rest, not usually typically where you train. Mm -hmm. we, we talked uh, la last week's episode, we talked a lot about motivation coming from a, an experiential uh, point of view um, from an Olympian. From, a, from the scientific side of things, especially when there's a, a nagging injury or you should be resting, um, what things can we do to continually motivate ourselves, in your opinion? Uh, so one aspect of things that you can do to motivate yourself is, one, take a look at your surroundings. Who do you have around you? You have your family. You have your teammates. Uh, you have your friends. There's lots of different um, social supports that you can draw upon. And I definitely recommend to people to kind of reach out to those aspects, those individuals, because they're not there just when you're in person, face to face. They're also there through group chats, Zoom phone calls or texting and phone call in general kind of thing like that. So I think it's definitely uh, one area that you can draw upon um, to kind of keep yourself motivated. Uh, another little aspect of it is to also set up um, a routine as you come through with it. Uh, so a nice way to kind of go through those aspects of things is setting up a schedule. So if you have a bit of 
uh, a schedule in place, something that's physical that you can look at and has a few runners, that's a great way to kind of keep yourself on track. So create a routine, put it into your phone, put it into your calendar, uh, write it out in front of you. And that's another way to kind of keep yourself motivated. Uh, mm -hmm. another, yeah, another aspect of things is a regular sleep, sleep schedule or a regular routine of waking up uh, is super helpful. Um, on times where we have a lot of moments throughout the day where we can rest and sleep and it doesn't really matter if we wake up early or late or whatever it may be, um, sticking and maintaining a regular schedule is super helpful to keep yourself motivated. Uh, and then coming through, we also have eating healthy, uh, make training fun. So ask your teammates, talk to them, and uh, take little videos of what you're doing, add a little bit of competition into it. Um, and also a nice way of thinking about it is take a moment to think about why do you love this sport? Why do you love competing? Why do you love practices? And really kind of see what aspects of that can I bring into my training at home? Is it the fact that I get to do a little competition with friends? Is it the fact that I get to kind of engage with them? Is it the fact that I get to push myself? How can you incorporate those aspects of things into your training at home? Yeah, that's great information. One thing uh, we spoke about with our mental performance consultant, Jeff Hackett, was um, and I want to link this into your imagery and visualization point. Um, I think it's so important because we've all had goals um, during before the pandemic hit, you know, whether it's, you know, I'm, I'm aiming for preseason or whether it's, I'm in, I'm in post competition and I'm, I'm now, um, I'm in a different training mode. So again, resetting them goals and then using the network around you and the social support around you to, to be held accountable with them goals as well. So, um, do you, have you had any experience with that or have any of your clients uh, had to reset their goals during this, um, during this pandemic? Yeah, they've definitely had to kind of take a bit of a step back and realize that like, wow. Um, so I know somebody who's been training for a marathon, they qualified for Boston marathon, which is amazing, right? That's awesome. You work super hard to be able to get there and be able to kind of achieve that goal. And now you got to take a step back kind of thing. Um, and you can't actually do that aspect of things. So how do you modify things? How do you kind of readjust your planning as you go through with it? So uh, a nice way to think about things is that, you know what, maybe I can't achieve goal A that I had right now because of the pandemic, um, but what can I control? What can I focus on right now? And can I stick to that? This is a time where sometimes, or I guess in life, often we don't have a moment to take a step back and be like, okay, what haven't I been able to focus on for the past little bit of time? Because this was the big thing that I had to get to. So now is an opportunity to take, a set, uh, take some time and be like, okay, maybe I'm going to focus on this goal for right now. And I'm going to get back to the other goal when it's appropriate and when we're allowed to. <laughs> Yeah, and surely that, that flexibility and that, that improvisation is going to help you in the long run because we all know that that can be the difference in, in performance. Oh, for sure. Okay, um, would you like to delve into some of the content now based on um, what we're doing at home? Yeah, for sure. Uh, so shall we, I guess we can start off with a little bit of the plyometric training aspect of things. Sounds good. All right. Do you want to uh, maybe just give a, a little brief summary on, on what plyometric is and, 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 and probably the benefits? Yeah, for sure. So uh, plyometric training, uh, for one, it is high intensity training that uh, involves um, increased amount of load. So it can be upper extremity or lower extremity. And there's a bit of a difference between plyometrics and high intensity training. So plyometrics often involve more load, such as jumping, I mean, more, uh, I guess, ballistic movements. And high intensity training can still be intense, but it might not necessarily involve the same amount of jumping or intensity or load that you're putting into things. Uh, so one aspect of things uh, that high intensity training and plyometrics do offer uh, you, if you use it as kind of a supplement to your training, um, and it has become a really uh, popular way of training right now, mainly because it involves minimal equipment and we can do it at home. Um, there's a positive transfer to sports. So it actually uh, positively correlates between jumping sports, throwing sports, uh, water sports, running. 
Um, it is a means of injury prevention. So uh, by injury prevention, you're learning proper loading mechanics, landing mechanics, and it's also a way to prepare you for more intense bouts of uh, exercise that you will see in competition. Uh, it leads to improved strength, power, and speed, and it also improves running, uh, leads to better running economy as well. So high intensity training and plyometrics definitely have a lot of uh, benefits coming through with it. Mm -hmm. And I'm guessing this is something I shouldn't do every day. Not that I'm doing plyometrics every day, I'm going to be honest with you. But is this <laughs> something I can do every day without, you know, within the injury prevention landscape? Uh, definitely not. Uh, I don't think there are too many things that we can do every day without uh, injuring ourselves. But uh, this is a little, a little bit of a research study by uh, Booth and Orr. But it gives you kind of a bit of a background uh, depending on what your sport is. Um, and it also lets you know kind of general recommendations with regards to plyometric training. So taking a look at it here, we can see for no matter what your background is, two to three times a week at most is really what they're kind of recommending coming through with regards to plyometric training. Um, on top of that is it's making sure that you can see here the number of contacts that you have in. So contacts is the number of jump, jumps or explosive bouts that you have. And it also has a recommended um, amount of rest. So taking a look here, you can see that it's not just high intensity, go, go, go 100% for the entire duration of your workout. To get the most out of it is you want an appropriate amount of rest between your sets so that you can give it your all. You can push yourself and that's going to help you improve. And what's interesting is that you can combine this with uh, like you've got here, Olympic lifting. Is that, is that, is that what I'm reading there? Yeah. So uh, it's trying to, what the, the study kind of looked at and everything is, is that um, you don't only want to do your plyometrics on their own. It can be combined with Olympic lifting, uh, conventional RT, which is conventional strength training aspect of things, as well as your regular um, supplementary training, sports specific training that you've also been doing as well. So it also dispels a myth of, uh, you know, double loading and, and um, kind of burnout. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So it's just, it's finding that right balance is yeah. the kind of key portion of it. And also trying to follow along, depending on what stage you are in competition, preseason, wherever it may be, is making sure that the level of intensity and load that you're working out at also correlates with kind of what you're doing, going to be doing on the field or uh, court, pool, whatever it may be. Mm -hmm. um, so, and you think these are, would you have these in every program that has a kind of a dynamic element to it or explosive element to it? Oh, for sure. I think that uh, as we saw kind of the benefits going uh, listed above is that plyometrics are a great way of adding some intensity um, into a workout program. And it uh, also allows you to kind of reduce a little bit of the volume that you're putting in, but still upping the intensity and having all the strength benefits, power benefits, and speed benefits that come through with things. Great, so for some of our listeners here, do you have any resources or, or any, because if I type plyometrics into Google, I'm sure a billion searches are gonna come up. Any way I can filter that down or, or maybe look for something that's uh, beneficial to me and, and the traits that I have? Uh, I definitely think that going through um, Google-wise, I would say, Honestly, first and foremost, I actually tend to tell people uh, to go to your training, your trainer kind of thing. So mm -hmm. if you have a strength coach, if you have um, a somebody who runs your kind of fitness aspect of things is you can ask them, what should I be focusing on a little bit more on that aspect of things? So they give you a little bit of guidance and you can be like, oh, okay, all right, this is where I want to be. But then when it comes down to if you don't have a lot of that option of things, or if you're looking at to spice things up a little bit in your workout routine is to find things that uh, correlate a little bit with what you're doing. So if you have a sport that involves throwing your upper body, then you got to make sure that your plyometrics also include upper body, not just lower body jumps and aspects of things. Makes sense. Yeah. Uh, moving on. Um, did you want to talk about some more of the content based uh, um, subject um, like cardio and, yeah. and lifting as well? Yeah, so uh, I guess the kind of next portion that we were going to kind of look into it is uh, cardio-wise um, and adding a bit of variety into your cardio. Um, 
and adding variety into cardio and also strength training. Um, one big aspect of it is it maintains motivation, uh, especially if you're doing the same thing day in and day out, same workout day in and day out. It's going to get pretty boring. You're going to get sick of it a little bit, but you're also not going to have the benefits of adaptation and everything like that. So uh, variety maintains motivation and it also uh, helps to challenge you and change you. Uh, another aspect of variety is uh, it minimizes the risk of repetition related injuries. So, so, so repeats or something that's a little bit more hilly um, you can add some intensity and actually decrease the volume a little bit so uh, it gives you a kind of a little bit of a double whammy as you go through with it so you can uh, push yourself harder but not train as long and how, how much would you suggest people run for and and how does that correlate with trying to get to their their max if you like in terms of cardio output uh, I think it depends a little bit on uh, one previous training and their kind of baseline and also typically you are a runner and you've been running for a fair amount of time then uh, no problems with it you can kind of stick to your routine uh, but the biggest recommendation that I say when it comes down to running is more often is actually better. So let's just say running four times a week is better than running once a week because that mm -hmm. spreads out the load and it allows your body to get used to things. Because again, injuries happen when it's too much too soon or it's just something that's new that comes up. So only doing something once a week increases the risk of injury. So trying to do things a little bit more often is generally a better recommendation and starting off slow and building up from there so don't go right away into kind of running for an hour running 20 kilometers ease yourself into it depending on kind of what your background is mm -hmm. and with hill runs do you recommend that being a over a longer period of time or or put into more of a short workout I recommend more of a shorter workout coming through. So think of it as like a speed workout or more intense interval tr style training workout as you come through with it. So mm -hmm. a little bit less volume, a little bit more intensity. So less time, more intensity. Excellent. Okay. Now in terms of uh, lifting. All right. So when it comes down to lifting, uh, I think a big thing that a lot of people can be a little bit concerned with is maintaining the gains that you've made. We, before all this happened, we had the freedom to go to the gym, go to the school gym, whatever it may be, um, as freely as we want to and train. And not everybody has the opportunity to have a home gym or have access to weights. Uh, so uh, one kind of nice thing that I wanted to touch on is that uh, there's a few research studies that have been out there, but uh, you can actually, gains can be maintained if you, uh, for up to four weeks um, without kind of doing consistent training or anything like that, which is, is nice to know. Um, it doesn't mean that it's going to be hard to come back into and you don't ease yourself in, but gains are able to be maintained for up to four weeks, depending on your previous level of training. Uh, but even if you don't have access to uh, weights or your regular routine that you did before, a uh, nice thing to consider is that uh, you can actually maintain uh, the gains that you've made um, with as little as one day a week of resistance training. So if you can find time to kind of throw together, whether it's filling a backpack full of something or finding some rocks around, whatever it may be, getting a little bit creative, um, if you can kind of work at incorporating resistance training or even uh, plyometric training, high intensity training, um, you can actually allow yourself to kind of maintain those gains that you've had prior to the whole shutdown and closure of things. Yeah. And when lifting rule of thumb, if you want to do 
if you want to, if you're doing a lighter weight, so you haven't got your home gym mm -hmm. and you are getting a little bit creative, picking up, picking up rocks or <laughs> logs or whatever's, whatever's in and around your environment. Um, you know, what's the, if you've got lighter weights, but you're trying to reach them gains again, um, is it more repetitions? Uh, you have a couple options. So you can do more repetitions. Positions. You can also play around with tempo and holding a position a little bit longer. So uh, one thing we also think we tend to like go to is oh, it's lighter. I'm going to lift it ten times more as what I would usually do. But even just working at slowing something down and putting some real kind of uh, time under tension kind of thing, uh, you can really work at making some gains there as well. And how can resistance bands help? I, I was. I was walking in the neighborhood the other day and I saw some guy with a crazy contraption with resistant bands and he had uh, stones hanging from it and I couldn't quite see what was going on. Uh, so I just wondered, uh, how can you get creative with resistance bands and being safe? Uh, so, and being safe. Well, yeah. one, make sure that they're anchored onto something that's fixed. That's, that's always number one. Uh, but uh, if you're using it in that aspect. But uh, resistance bands are a great way. Um, they're cheap. They are portable, you can kind of bring them anywhere, and you can actually be pretty creative with them. So if you have an exercise that you typically do with weights, you're more than welcome to try it out with a resistance band. And what is nice is it adds tension as you're on your way up, on your way back down through the movement. Um, so it's a great way, although weights, you're always uh, have the weight, no matter what way you're doing it, but uh, the resistance bands allow you to kind of play around with things and maybe challenge yourself in ways that you don't typically do with just uh, free weights, dumbbells, barbells, whatever it may be. Yeah. And I feel like they, uh, they must, they must increase a little bit of mobility as well. When I've tried them, um, it, it, you just feel that a little bit more flexible. Is that something that's, that's in there? Oh, um, not necessarily. Not. <laughs> <laughs> maybe. Uh, uh, a nice portion of the bands is I do find, or uh, yeah, I guess a band, is you can work through like a full range of motion and you may be able to go a little bit right. further into your range. So that must be it. yeah, if, you're, if you can find yourself moving more through a range with it, um, then it's totally beneficial in that aspect of things. Um, but there's also an opportunity to do a little bit more eccentric work and different things like that on slowing things down on the, that aspect of things. Great. Mm -hmm. Um, and then uh, I guess we'll kind of tie this together with some talk on the, before we open this out for questions, um, on the psychological and social aspect, which we kind of touched upon. Um, but how, how important is it to be happy within your training? Or do you need to be grinding, miserable, and almost in tears to get gains? <laughs> uh, definitely not. I, I, I think that um, uh, there's a big focus uh, on what I tell my clients and my patients and everything like that is, there should be a good balance between working in and working out um, and also finding some joy enjoyment in what you're doing. So there's a difference between something being challenging and hard and you're grinding your way through it versus something being something that you hate and that you're kind of slogging your way through it, if that makes, makes sense. Uh, so I think um, now is a really good time for people to, and athletes uh, in general to just take a moment and take a look at like, what do I love about the sport that I'm doing? What do I love? Is it that feeling? Is it whatever it may be that really kind of keeps you going, keeps you waking up day in and day out and training your hardest and holding on to that aspect of things? Because if you really hate what you're doing day in and day out, you're not going to get stronger. You're not going to get better. You're not going to get faster. You're going to get fed up eventually and burnt out. So it's focusing on the good aspects of things and focusing on the things that you really enjoy. And you're not going to enjoy every aspect of training, that's for sure, but it should be predominantly uh, something that you enjoy. I think it's a great message. And I think also um, you can use your, you can expand your training into maybe taking hikes and doing something that's, um, that just really helps you as a person and, and uh, helps you get through this challenging time as well. Yeah, I definitely think this is a great opportunity depending on where you're located and resources that you have around you is um, a nice way to kind of mix it up a little bit is if there's something that's fitness related or um, some type of physical activity that you really love doing or you find enjoyment or peace in or 
um, but it still challenges you, that's a great way to incorporate it into your training. You can, you don't only have to go for a run and do hill repeats or anything like that. Going for an awesome hike kind of thing like that is going to help you improve your cardio. It's going to help you maintain things. And it's also going to help if you enjoy doing it, it's going to help keep you in a good frame of mind. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I think we'll open this out to questions now. Um, if you would like to, um, if you'd like to turn on your, your camera and your mic and ask questions, that's great. We welcome you to do that. Um, or if you just want to shoot us a message, then you're welcome to do that as well. Um, so please feel free to ask any questions. I'll quickly check my chat box. Um, I don't know if Jeff's still on the call. Jeff, are you still here? Yep, I am. Did you see any questions come through, bud? Uh, no, I don't. I don't see anything here. Got to be some questions out there. I know there's some some folks rehabbing. I wonder how that's going in this time now. It must be pretty, pretty tricky. Um, obviously, a lot of people that you're dealing with, Antoinette, are in rehab um, in terms of their injuries. And what kind of what kind of uh, issues are you getting, and um, how are you how are you guiding them through this? Uh, for right now, I'm actually getting a lot of uh, overuse injuries. That's a, that's a big one that's coming through uh, because people are, one, they have a lot more time to train and they're training a little bit harder, but they're also adding in a few uh, extra activities that they don't usually do, whether it's renos, whether it's housework, whatever it may be. Um, so my big suggestion to them kind of thing is just making sure that you kind of take a look at what you're doing, take a look at your goals and uh, modify things a little bit. You don't have to go 100% into everything, but finding ways to kind of address um, the injury, the pain, whatever it may be, um, and still get to work out around that. So it's finding a way to modify um, the niggle factors of the thing that's giving you pain, um, but still being able to be active a little bit more. and take the time to focus on the injury and get it better. So while you have time. Yeah. And I guess if you're incredibly limited in what you can do, then the whole, the, the rest of the, uh, the kind of the environment has to, has to be really spot on. And, and what I mean by that is nutrition, the sleep, um, the whole, the whole environment. Would you agree? Oh, for sure. That's been a, a big portion of kind of the sessions I have with patients uh, these days has been talking a lot of bit. It's not just about the physical stuff that they've been doing, but how are you managing to have your home and your work environment and your family environment be all in one location 24 seven kind of thing like that. So it's just making sure that they have kind of strategies in place, whether it's a schedule, whether it's um, making sure that they kind of maybe set themselves up in a different corner of the room or whatever it may be to have a bit of differentiation uh, between all that. So that way their mind stays healthy um, and their body stays healthy. Yeah, that's a great answer. Uh, yeah, we've got a couple of questions coming through. Um, can you see the questions, uh, Antoinette? Uh, no. Okay. Um, so Darren's a more experienced soccer player. Um, and the coach. Oh, there we go. Uh, I can see the question now. Oh, you can see the question. Awesome. Yeah. I won't tell him your age, Darren. <laughs> is it so? And oh, so okay. Yeah. So is, is, is it wrong to have no interest in weightlifting? Um, he's, um, he's done most cardio, uh, throughout his life training in soccer. So, uh, maybe you can shed some light on that. Antoinette. Yeah, so it's okay to have no interest in weightlifting. Um, so Darren specifically, do you mean like lifting weights or are you opposed to kind of like body weight training or anything like that? Darren's loving the, loving the episode, so that's great. No interest in going, I'd rather cycle. <laughs> All right, so honestly, um, I firmly believe that you can get uh, strength gains and keep yourself injury free and everything like, or minimize your risk of injury 
um, without being specifically in a gym setting. It's not for everybody kind of thing like that. Um, but it's just making sure that if uh, to keep yourself active and moving, so keeping yourself playing soccer, mountain biking and everything like that, um, to keep you going with that is to, if you can find a way to do a little bit of strength um, and a little bit of mobility, uh, whether it's at home, whether it's outside in your backyard kind of thing like that, whether it's putting a little bit more hill work into uh, your mountain biking kind of thing like that, those are definitely options that you can do to kind of keep yourself going uh, with your sport. So it, you don't have to find yourself in a gym to make gains, but if you want to keep yourself going with things is it's not only doing one thing, but adding a little bit of variety into what you do. Yeah. And that kind of, that's a good segue for Olivia's question. She said, how often should we be doing cardio and weights without overdoing it? And I do know Olivia, so maybe I'm guessing she's, she means like, should it be done together and how many times through the week? Like she doesn't want to be burning out. Fair enough. Uh, so hope, hope that's right. Oh. <laughs> yeah. uh, so uh, when it comes down to how often you should be training, uh, I often like try to kind of have you focus on what your coach has planned that has given you kind of thing like that. So usually there's a bit of recommendation on how often you should, but in general, uh, depending on level of kind of whether it's more advanced level, intermediate level of play, depending on where you are, um, minimum, I'd say two to three strength sessions a week, kind of thing like that. That's at the lower end. Definitely more is okay, but uh, definitely I wouldn't say going every day. Uh, so I'd say two to three to five to six at the upper echelon of things. And then when it comes down to cardio, you can go anywhere from four days a week to kind of six days a week, but it's just finding days where you have a bit of rest and recovery when it comes down to it. Uh, but the best way to kind of manage and to know, am I burning out is, are you becoming very fatigued at your recovery sessions? So if this is supposed to be an easier run, so maybe you're out for a little 20 minute recovery run. And if it feels like you're going through quicksand, it's a bit of a kind of a signal to yourself to say, Am I doing too much? Uh, should I kind of take a look at the bigger plan? Um, or should I allow a little bit more rest in between my sessions? So should I do a heavier or a longer cardio day on a Sunday and give myself a rest day on a Monday and then go back into my strength training on Tuesday? Kind of thing like that. Yeah, and then everything changes with uh, sport-specific uh, requirements and then obviously the periodized time within the year yeah. as well. Um, so, for instance, uh, you know, from our, from my point of view as a uh, as a soccer coach, um, with the, within the soccer team environment, we we are kind of pre preseason, if you like. So, mm -hmm. um, our object is to get uh, get that cardio base um, and have a strength program as well, more so for the injury prevention. Mm -hmm. um, so, when you say uh, ask your coach, I think that's great advice. However, I think that's probably a bit diverse because you know, we have some coaches that volunteer, put in a lot of hours, but um, maybe lean on people like yourself, Antoinette, to, uh, to give that advice. Um, so ask your coach, I think, is a great message, um, but also utilize uh, whatever the tools are at your disposal, whether it is a local physio or professional law. And if you're going to look online, make sure it's credible resources, right? Yeah, and I always tell people, um, the one nice thing that has come from all of this is that uh, I've actually opened up a little bit more of uh, phone consults. So not just myself, there's numerous physios around the island and the area kind of thing like that. So it's an opportunity to kind of realize that like, oh, there is an opportunity and personal trainers and strength coaches, a lot has become an online platform thing. So if you're sitting there and you're really like in a moment, you're like, I don't know how to organize this. I don't really know where I'm at with things reach out to the professionals in your area kind of thing. Google who's around you. Say, I'm a soccer player looking for a physio kind of thing. Pair the two together and you got to try to find somebody who aligns with your interests, your motivation. Um, and you can always pick their brain kind of thing like that. And if they don't have the answer, they're usually pretty good, pretty nice, and they'll direct you towards somebody who can help you out. Right. Any more questions, folks? Well, if there's no questions right now, I've been dying to ask about... Um, How's the, how did, how did working for the armed forces prepare you um, for, for the rest of your career right now? How, how did that affect it? How did that affect it? Uh, honestly, I was super green, super new out of my uh, program when I started. Uh, 
but I got to work with a variety of individuals who I never thought I would uh, provide exercise programs and rehabilitation programs for. Um, uh, but I also got an opportunity there, continuing education aspect of things and the opportunities that allowed me to do was amazing. I got to work with SISM sports, um, and local, like uh, regional sports. So I got to cover events like that. Um, I also got to do fitness programs, fitness classes for group set, uh, groups as well as individuals. So it really, honestly, I am super thankful for that job because it gave me a really well-rounded approach to everything that I do by pushing me out of my comfort zone, but also mm -hmm. providing me a great resource of education and support to kind of help me grow as a practitioner um, in general. Did you feel a certain amount of additional pressure working for the armed forces? Oh, for sure. I re yeah. <laughs> yeah, there's a, lot, <laughs> there's a lot of aspects of things where in school going through things, I was just like, oh, you know, I'll work with people who want to be active kind of thing. But for yeah. some of these individuals, being active and being able to move is their job, right? Mm. Uh, so it's super important to make sure that the programs that I'm providing them with and how I'm helping them through things, not only kind of get them back to their day to day life, but actually allow them to keep doing the job that they signed on to do. Amazing. Okay. We've got some questions coming through. Flexibility. Great point, Darren. Um, yeah, let's talk about flexibility. How important is it? Uh, so flexibility is super dependent on, well, Darren, well, what's your sport? I think uh, so. Oh, mountain biking and soccer. Yeah. yeah so, uh, sorry, I remember we're rolling back in there. Uh, yeah. But, but yeah, so it's just then uh, flexibility is important uh, based off of the activities that you do, right? So for a runner, having super flexible hamstrings and calves isn't, really a big priority kind of thing like that but having more mobility in your hip flexors and your quads is going to be super important because that's going to help uh make you a better runner make you a better turnover and everything like that so uh when it comes down to flexibility is it is sport specific but i would say mobility and your ability to move through a position or something that's sport specific related is way more important than just flexibility of being able to hold the position. Does that, does that make sense? Yeah. 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 There was a little bit of a misconception there. Sometimes I'm guilty of it too, of thinking I'm just going to train my flexibility when um, it's the mobility. That's the key, right? Yeah. So if I can move my leg through a full range of motion, that's going to be way more beneficial to my sport than me just being able to hold it in one position, right? There's not too many sports where you just have to kind of, hold yourself in a specific position and not move at all. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. It's a great question, Darren. Thanks for that. Um, agility. Um, so some tools and exercises Kate has asked uh, to improve agility and explosive running. So, all right. Uh, so definitely getting into uh, some kind of like ladder drills, some directional changes and everything like that. So, um, when it comes down to agility, you want to think of, okay, for running, if it's, you're a soccer player, we'll say, um, you're not just running straight, you're running in multiple directions. So drills that you're going to do is you want to make sure that they encompass those aspects of things. Um, so directional change, straight, side to side, going back, everything. Um, but you also want to make sure you do specific touches and repetitions that allow those aspects of things to be kind of muscle memory. Um, so drills that you would do would be kind of like almost slowing down your cut or your change of direction. You start with that and then you start to build onto it and add speed and intensity to it. Um, and then eventually you can maybe even add in a ball coming in and different things like that. Hmm. How to prevent shin splints. Ah. <laughs> All right. So uh, shin splints, they are never fun. <laughs> um, a great what, what, what exactly what exactly are they Antoinette from a, so, from a scientific point of view uh shin splints are a form of tendinopathy and they can come from the uh tib anterior or tib posterior depending so in the middle portion of your shin or in the front portion of your shin uh depending on who you are and how you're training kind of thing like that mm -hmm. um and what happens oftentimes is it's when you're again it coming down to doing a little bit too much too soon 
Uh, so a little bit too much intensity, a little bit too much volume coming through with it. Uh, so a good way to kind of prevent it, one is having a solid strength foundation to that lower extremity of your legs. So uh, thinking of doing some good calf raises or um, in different aspect of things and inversion, E version of the ankle coming through. So making sure that the ankle um, and lower leg is nice and strong. Um, the other portion to kind of help prevent them and minimize them a little bit is kind of easing yourself into it. So it's understanding that if I'm going to go from trail running to all of a sudden I have to go play on the turf. So I'm going from trails to turf, different surfaces, right? So we want to make sure that we have a little bit of a gradual flow, a gradual change um, coming through. So whatever you choose to do is making sure that it's not all or none. So you kind of try to do like 80, 20, then you kind of go 70, 30, and you keep peppering it in to add in those changes. So gradual is the key to kind of avoiding uh, shin splints. Yeah. Is that helpful? Yeah, big time. Okay. I, I think yeah. that's a great message. Uh, we have another one here. Um, uh, fasted starts. I heard a fellow Strava cyclist speak of this. Fasted starts. Is that, is that what I'm saying? Oh, like a fasting is a not eating prior to? No, he goes for four hours and said the first 40 minutes he does not eat. Yeah. I go for four, I go for rides in the morning before I can eat. Can you speak to fasted starts? Uh, I haven't uh, looked in too much into fasted starts, but I do know that kind of with regards to training for like longer distance running and different things like that, um, there's definitely a recommendation of having a bit of kind of intake prior to and throughout, especially if you're doing a four, four hour training bout. Was that what it was? Mm -hmm. So is this intermittent fasting? He, is that the same thing? I'm guessing. I think so. You, yeah, you think? Yeah, is that I think. Intermittent fasting, Darren? Yes. Okay. Sorry, you were saying um, uh, long distance runners? Uh, but coming into it is there is to kind of get you going um, prior to is having a little bit of kind of uh, higher glycemic index. So something that's a little bit more carby um, to get you going to get started um, helps uh, to kind of throughout the duration of your training session and also helps keep the intensity up and everything like that. Um, I can't really speak to um, fasted starts. I don't know too, too much about it, but I do know that kind of general recommendation that I do have for people is that they do ingest a bit of kind of carbohydrates prior to the event and depending on the duration of the event. So if it's over an hour of cardiovascular is you're starting to ingest some, cardi uh, some carbohydrates throughout um, and electrolytes and whatnot um, to kind of maintain your level of intensity and to kind of keep the performance from dwindling as you go uh, throughout the event. Okay, hopefully that answers that, Darren. Any more questions, folks? So uh, as we were just chatting beforehand, Antoinette, now there's, uh, we're seeing some restrictions being lifted. Um, how does it look for your uh, landscape in your industry right now? Uh, what's going to happen, do you feel, over the next few weeks? Uh, so there's some changes coming in the next couple of weeks. Uh, so two weeks time, we're set to be back in clinic. So we're going to start to see patients in person again. Um, obviously dependent on if the individual is uh, comfortable, but it's going to involve masks. It's going to involve a lot of hand washing and different protocols. It's also going to look a little bit different when it comes down to my gym setting, which is a huge component of what I do day to day kind of thing like that. So it's not going to go right back to kind of how it was before. It is still going to look a little bit different. Um, so it's going to be a lot of kind of like room-based things and uh, general things of kind of trying to minimize the spread of uh, infection or anything like that by touching numerous items in the gym space. Uh, we're still waiting for our full uh, guidelines from our uh, governing body, so the College of Physiotherapists. Uh, that's set to come out next week, so we'll have uh, set protocols to go forward and how things are going to look. Okay, well, uh, wish you all the best with that. Um, oh. Yeah, and, and hope you guys stay safe doing it. I hope you guys stay safe as well. And uh, yeah. thanks a lot for having me. <laughs>
no, that's that was amazing. If there's no more questions, we'll we'll wrap this up. Um, with uh, with Pacific Sport, we're constantly trying to evolve how we put education out there. Um, if you have any ideas or feedback, please you can email all our email us uh, at kalindo@pacificsport.com or all our details are on pacificsportbi.com as well, and we're at Pacific Sport BI um, on social media. So that's Facebook and um, Instagram, I believe. Not my forte, but uh, I think we're out there. Um, I'm working on some new episodes coming up. I am trying to get a nutritionist and dietitian on. Um, we've also got a UFC athlete we're going to be talking to in the next couple of weeks um, and how that environment is really affecting their lives. Um, so we've got some exciting speakers coming on. Um, Antoinette, this was awesome. Thank you so much. Really appreciate it. And hopefully we can do a second episode. Awesome. Thanks a lot for having me. No problem. Take care. Thanks. Take care.